January 13th, 1976. Bomaris, Australia. The family of eight-year-old Eloise Warledge wakes up to discover that she has mysteriously vanished from their suburban home. Eyewitness testimony from neighbors seems to support the idea that Eloise was abducted from her bedroom in the middle of the night by an intruder. However, some of the evidence suggests that Eloise's abduction might have been staged, and since her parents were planning to begin a separation that very same morning, investigators start eyeing them as possible suspects. After that, the trail went cold. Wallage eyes are misty every Tuesday morn. Since January 13, that's the way it's been. And now it's May, still we haven't found a way to trace the whereabouts of the Elvis. The police appeals to everyone to be of help. So if you might know some small detail, please let it out. It ain't over yet, and every piece that they can get could help find where she is, pretty Eloise. Eloise, where are you now? Has anybody seen that fair-haired, green-eyed girl? Well, you think someone might care enough to give some information while her family hopes tomorrow brings her home? Hello everyone and welcome to a very special milestone. This is officially episode number 10 of The Trail Went Cold. I am your host Robin Warder and to commemorate this podcast foray into double digits, I am going to foray outside of North America and cover our very first international mystery. This week I am going down under to cover one of the most controversial cases in the history of Australia the 1976 disappearance of Eloise Warledge. That soundbite you just heard was taken from an episode of the Australian news program A Current Affair, and this particular episode aired on May 23rd, 1976, four months after Eloise went missing. And yes, an Australian pop band named Triangulum actually went on the show to perform a song which was dedicated to her. I am so glad we live in a world where you can access obscure stuff like this on YouTube, because I honestly couldn't find any info on the internet at all about this band Triangulum, so I guess they are something of an unsolved mystery as well. But I digress. There are two main reasons I chose this particular mystery. Number one, it was a listener request from an Australian poster at the Unsolved Mysteries Forum at the Sitcoms Online message board, and the poster in question goes under the handle Corky's Place. I had actually never heard of this case before Corky's Place brought it to my attention, but once I started researching it and going down the rabbit hole, I knew it was an ideal candidate to cover on this podcast. So, thank you, Corky's Place. Uh, But there's also a second reason I wanted to select a case from Australia. Uh, You might recall that The Trail Went Cold recently did an episode about the unexplained 1997 death of a woman named Judy Smith. Well, only three days after that episode was posted, uh, Marty O'Neill, a writer for the Australian news website news.com.au, published a feature-length article on the site about the Judy Smith case. And considering that it's a pretty obscure cold case which hasn't got any major exposure in years, I'm pretty sure this wasn't a coincidence. So uh, if you happen to be listening, Marty O'Neill, thank you for tuning into the podcast and giving Judy Smith's case some exposure. Uh, Even though the Eloise Warledge case hasn't got much exposure in recent years, it was a pretty sensational story in Australia when it originally happened. Uh, Whenever there's an unsolved case where a child is murdered or disappears, and there's a possibility the parents might be involved, it's definitely going to get a lot of play in the media. Uh, Two of the most famous examples of this are obviously John Benet Ramsey and Madeline McCann, so I guess you might consider Eloise Warledge to be their Australian equivalent. But before we get started, I have a big announcement to make. The Trail Went Cold now has its own PayPal account and a new donate button on the website for anyone who's feeling generous. Uh, Truth to be told, I originally hadn't considered the idea of implementing a donate button since we are still a relatively new podcast. Uh, However, I recently went to a thread at the Unresolved Mystery subreddit about the subject of donating to True Crime Podcast, and I was very, very surprised to see a few posters name The Trail Went Cold among the list of podcasts they'd be willing to donate money to. So thank you very much for that. Um, There's no 
pressure whatsoever at this point, but if anyone feels like donating to this podcast, we would be absolutely flattered and greatly appreciate it. But, like I said, no pressure. Uh, We're just very happy to be doing this. But uh, I still want to thank all my loyal listeners and supporters out there, uh, especially those from the aforementioned Unresolved Mysteries subreddit and the aforementioned Unsolved Mysteries message board at the Sitcoms Online Forum. As you can see, whenever possible, I like to accommodate your requests for cases to cover on this podcast, and of course I currently have a huge backlog, but I try to get to them when I can. Uh, The Trail Went Cold runs on a bi-weekly schedule, and a new episode is posted every other Wednesday. Uh, We've got our own Facebook and Twitter pages, and another big thank you to all my followers there. Uh, We're also available for download on several platforms, including iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Music, so if you like this podcast, be sure to subscribe to it. And if you give us a rating or a review on any of these platforms, you're opening the door for us to get more exposure and garner us some potential new listeners. So I also need to provide the obligatory shout-out to McGill Foote, who edits and assembles this podcast together for me, and is my fellow co-owner of The Back Row, the pop culture website which hosts this podcast. And of course, a big shout-out to Vince Nitro, who composes the eerie music you hear on every episode. So with that out of the way, let's begin the Trail Went Cold's first foray, Down Under. Our story begins in 1976 in Beaumaris, which is a suburb of Melbourne, the capital city of the Australian state of Victoria. Our central figure is eight-year-old Eloise Warlidge, who lives in a middle-class suburban home on Scott Street in Beaumaris with her two parents, Lindsay and Patsy Warlidge, who have been married ten years at this point. Eloise also has two other siblings, her six-year-old sister Anna and four-year-old brother Blake. On the morning of January 13th, the family woke up to discover that Eloise was inexplicably missing from her bedroom and nowhere to be found inside the house. When they failed to turn up any trace of her in the neighborhood, Eloise's parents notified the police. On the surface, the evidence inside Eloise's bedroom seemed to indicate a break-in and an abduction. Uh, The bedroom window was open, the curtains were pulled to one side, and someone had cut into the window's flywire screen and rolled the wire upwards to create a small hole. Uh, There were also traces of bark from the outside garden on the bedroom floor. However, there were no noticeable signs of a struggle. When Eloise's uh, younger brother Blake was questioned by the police, uh, he provided an interesting story. He claimed that at one point during the night, he heard what he described as robbers kidnapping his sister. Uh, Now, Blake didn't actually see anything, but he did say he heard some crackling sounds in Eloise's bedroom. And since the bedroom had seagrass floor coverings, this seemed to indicate that someone was walking through Eloise's room at that time. Uh, Interestingly, even though Blake woke up his parents that morning and told them that Eloise wasn't in her room, uh, he never actually told them about the noises he heard during the night. Uh, Apparently, Blake was initially too terrified to say anything because he thought these robbers might return and kidnap him as well. So, uh, once word spread about Eloise's disappearance, uh, police would receive reports of over 200 suspicious incidents in the area that night. Of course, most of these so-called suspicious incidents were innocuous and only seemed suspicious in hindsight because there was a panic about a possible child abduction. But there were quite a few eyewitness sightings which seemed to support the idea of an intruder breaking into the Warlidge home. Uh, Scott Street was not an area which was known for having much traffic, so there were a few incidents that stood out. Uh, At around midnight, one of the Warlidge's neighbors was walking down the street when she claimed she saw an unidentified young man walking along the fence line of the Warlidge home. Uh, Apparently this man made her feel a bit uneasy, so she actually crossed the street in order to avoid him. Uh, Around the same time period, another neighbor was driving down Scott Street when she saw a young man dart across the road in front of her car before he jumped over the fence onto the Warlidge property. I know both these sightings took place around midnight, but I wish I had a more exact timeline for when they occurred. If the young man seen by both these witnesses was the same person, I'm not sure why he would be seen walking along the Warledge's fence line, but also seen darting across the street from the opposite side and climbing over the Warledge's fence. The sightings don't seem to match up, but that's not the only interesting activity from the neighborhood that night. At approximately 2 a.m., two different neighbors, one of whom was the same witness who saw the young man walking along the fence line, uh, they claimed they heard the sounds of a child's cry, followed by the sound of a car door slamming. Uh, It's also worth mentioning that another witness claimed they saw a green Holden station wagon parked near the Warledge home at approximately 11.40 p.m., and the vehicle did not seem to belong there. And unfortunately, I'm not sure if either of the witnesses who encountered the young man shortly thereafter were able to recall if this vehicle was still parked there at that time. But interestingly enough, another witness actually recalled seeing this green station wagon parked in the neighborhood all the way back on January the 6th. And apparently, one month before that, a vehicle matching its description had been reported stolen from the Melbourne suburb of Carlton, but it was never recovered. But these aren't the only strange incidents from Scott Street on this particular night. At around 10 p.m., another neighbor thought he heard a prowler outside his house, and the following morning he discovered that his backyard tool shed had been broken into. 
But strangely, I don't think anything was actually stolen, as the perpetrator removed three chisels, a pair of garden shears, and an oil can from the shed, but then just left them on the nearby nature strip. Uh, investigators actually wondered if those shears might have been used to cut through the flywire screen, but that turned out not to be the case. And finally, there was one more neighbor who claimed he heard noises outside his house, which sounded like a prowler, at around 12.16 a.m. Yet in spite of all this potential evidence pointing to an outside intruder, there was one major red flag. When forensic testing was performed on the flywire screen in Eloise's bedroom, it seemed to indicate that the opening had been cut from the inside. And furthermore, the opening just did not seem large enough for someone to fit through with a child. And there was dust and cobwebs on the window which had been undisturbed. It seemed impossible that Eloise could have been taken from the home through that window, and the likely exit point was probably the front door. Uh, police started thinking that Eloise might have been lured out of her bedroom, but by all accounts, she was an incredibly shy girl who would not have left the house in the middle of the night with a stranger. Uh, the unusual way the flywire screen was cut seemed to indicate that someone made an attempt to stage an abduction scene, so inevitably, investigators started focusing their attention on the parents, Lindsay and Patsy Warledge. Because as it turns out, the Warledge's marriage was not in a good place at that time. Uh, Lindsay and Patsy had drifted apart, and in fact, both of them had been carrying on extramarital affairs with other people. In September of the previous year, the couple finally made a mutual agreement to separate, but Lindsay asked if he could remain in the family's home until November because he was completing his master's degree and would be taking some final exams at that time. Well, Lindsay completed his exams, but then he asked if he could remain in the home until after Christmas. Uh, the holidays came and went, and in early January, Lindsay and Patsy finally broke the news of their impending separation to their children. Uh, Lindsay told them he would move out on January the 10th, which just happened to be his wife's birthday. Uh, however, Lindsay did not actually follow through on that promise. Uh, that night, Patsy attended a birthday dinner at a friend's house across the street. Uh, Lindsay did not accompany his wife, but throughout the evening, some of the other guests claimed they felt that someone was spying on them through the windows, though Lindsay has always denied those allegations. Uh, when Patsy returned home from the party that night and discovered that Lindsay was still there, uh, the couple got into a very heated argument which lasted for a couple hours. It turns out Lindsay had spent the day inspecting a rental property and told the agents he needed two days before he made a decision about moving in. Two days later, Lindsay finally scheduled an appointment with the agent and he was officially going to sign the rental contract. However, at 4 o'clock that day, he called up the agent and said he would have to reschedule their appointment and postpone the contract signing until the following day. And, well, do the math here. The very day Lindsay was supposed to sign his rental contract and move out was the very same day Eloise was discovered missing. So let's look at the parents' movements on the evening of January 12th. Lindsay spent the night at home watching the kids while Patsy went to a dance class. Uh, Lindsay claimed he put Eloise to bed at around 10 o'clock. Uh, shortly thereafter, Patsy returned home and saw that Lindsay had fallen asleep in front of the television because he had been drinking heavily that night. Uh, Patsy briefly went across the street to visit a friend and returned at about 10.30. She noticed that the front door was wide open, and while the adjacent flywire screen door was closed, it was not latched shut. However, Patsy never did get around to closing or locking the front door. Uh, she checked in on her children, including Eloise, and went to bed at around 11 o'clock. Uh, Lindsay claimed that he went to bed at around 11.40. He also said he checked in on the children and that Eloise was still in her bed at that time, but Patsy found this unusual, as Lindsay apparently did not have a tendency to check in on his children before he went to sleep. Uh, Lindsay also claimed that he forgot to check the front door, since he mistakenly assumed his wife had already closed it, so as far as everyone knows, the house was unlocked that night. Uh, Lindsay claimed that when he woke up the next morning and went outside to get the paper, the front door was now closed. And one more thing, like many families with young children, the Warlidges had a routine in which they would leave the hall light on when their kids went to sleep, and would subsequently turn the light off when they went to bed themselves. But on this particular night, Lindsay apparently forgot to turn off the hall light. However, at approximately 4.45 a.m., Patsy briefly woke up to use the bathroom, and she claimed that the hall light was off by this point. So did an intruder enter the home that night through the unlocked front door, and then turn the hall light off before they left? There was also suspicion about Lindsay's rather subdued reaction at his daughter's disappearance that morning. While Patsy appeared to be panic-stricken, Lindsay sounded rather unemotional when he called the police to report Eloise missing. Uh, the words he apparently used were that there had been a break-in at his house, and the only thing missing was his eight-year-old daughter. Uh, later that day, Lindsay called the real estate office to once again cancel his contract signing, and when they asked why, he offhandedly said, read the papers. And considering their troubled domestic situation, Patsy did not hesitate to share her suspicions about Lindsay with the police. Uh, Lindsay had become quite depressed over the impending separation, and his constant delay tactics at moving out of the house made his wife wonder if he might have orchestrated Eloise's disappearance, either despite her or delay the inevitable. 
In fact, the investigators did ask Lindsay and Patsy to temporarily postpone their separation until Eloise was found, as they didn't want their personal issues to overshadow the search for their child. So would Lindsay actually be brazen enough to make his own daughter disappear and use her as a pawn in a desperate attempt to repair his broken marriage? Well, if so, his scheme didn't really work, as the situation only caused Lindsay and Patsy to become even more distant and grow apart from each other. Lindsay finally wound up moving out of the house in June, and the Warledge's marriage did eventually come to an end for good. But even though there was a lot more suspicion directed towards Lindsay than Patsy, uh, the whole situation compelled police to treat both parents as suspects. So, needless to say, the case caused quite a sensation in Australia in 1976, uh, prompting the largest missing person search in the history of Victoria. Uh, there was a $10,000 reward offered, and two weeks after Eloise's disappearance, someone phoned Patsy claiming they had kidnapped Eloise and were demanding $10,000 for her return. Uh, however, this person just turned out to be some 17-year-old punk who was staging a hoax. While looking through the Google News archives, I came across a few articles which were published in the days following the disappearance, and they mentioned that police were searching for a young man who had been seen going through the area as a door-to-door -door canvasser. Uh, apparently this guy was knocking on doors to tell people he was conducting a survey on child education, and he wanted to ask some questions about school children. But unfortunately, I have no idea if police ever tracked this guy down and identified him. Uh, over the years, police have also investigated a few sex offenders who were known to be living in the area at that time, but they've never uncovered any evidence to connect them with Eloise's disappearance. And even though both Lindsay and Patsy Warledge were treated as suspects at the outset, uh, no hard evidence was ever found to suggest they were responsible either. Uh, the case was reopened by cold case detectives in 2001 and got a lot of fresh media attention. In February 2002, uh, Lindsay was re-interviewed and he agreed to take a lie detector test, but the results were inconclusive. And unfortunately, when the case was reopened, the new detectives on the case discovered that a lot of key evidence and documentation from the original investigation was now missing. Uh, these included the records of the original police interviews with Lindsay from back in 1976, so it was impossible to determine just how well Lindsay's story about what happened that night would hold up. Uh, by this point, Lindsay and Patsy had both remarried and seemed to have come to terms with the fact that Eloise's disappearance might never be solved. Uh, in an interview, Patsy stated that the family had, in her words, come to our own form of closure. Uh, to this day, she is still a fairly prominent figure in the Australian art world. I actually found an article about Patsy published in November 2014, which mainly focused on her artwork and only gave a passing mention to her daughter's infamous unsolved disappearance from four decades earlier. Uh, I have no idea what Lindsay has been up to since 2002, but at that point he had been remarried for 23 years and had recently retired after establishing a successful management consultancy. And in a tragic footnote to the story, the couple wound up losing their son as well, as Blake Warledge was struck by a car and killed in August 1997 at the age of 26. Uh, there really haven't been any major developments in this case at all for over a decade, so I guess you could say the trail went cold. Now, in all my previous episodes of this podcast, I already had a lot of knowledge of the featured case beforehand when I did my research, so I had my own preconceived theories. But this is the very first episode where I went into the case completely cold when I prepared everything. And I gotta say, it's a real puzzler. Uh, it's really hard to decide which side of the fence to fall on when it comes to pointing the finger at either the parents or a random intruder. While there is a lot of convincing evidence pointing to an abduction by an intruder, the opening in the bedroom window's fly screen is very baffling to me. I just don't know why an intruder would go to the trouble of cutting that hole from inside the bedroom. Uh, earlier, I made a reference to the John Benet Ramsey case, and there are some interesting parallels. Uh, in both cases, it looks on the surface like a young girl was victimized by a random intruder who broke into her home. But you just can't shake the disturbing feeling that the evidence pointing to an intruder might have been staged and that someone from the victim's family might be responsible. I guess it's an eerie coincidence that the mothers from both these families are named Patsy, though Patsy Warledge does seem like a much more down-to-earth individual than Patsy Ramsey. Of course, in high-profile cases where children are murdered or go missing and the parents are treated as suspects, you just know that their behavior is going to be micromanaged to death. As we've seen in such cases as John Benet Ramsey or Madeline McCann, if the parents aren't quote-unquote grieving properly, or if they seem too cold, distant, or unemotional about what happened to their child, a lot of people are automatically going to take their reactions as a sign of guilt. When Patsy Wardledge stated that the family had come to their own form of closure, I have no doubt that some people took that as a major red flag. Uh, they were probably horrified that Patsy used a news article to promote her artwork rather than promote Eloise, even though the case was nearly 40 years old at that point. 
And of course, a lot of people were instantly suspicious of Lindsay Warlich because he gave off this cold looking, unemotional reaction to his daughter going missing. But personally, in unsolved cases like this, I really don't like putting that much stock into the emotional reactions of a victim's family because different people just respond in different ways. Until you've been through a situation like this, it's impossible to know just how you're going to react. Uh, some people just aren't engineered to express a lot of emotion, and by all accounts, Lindsay Warlidge was always a full-fledged introvert and not the type of person to wear his heart on his sleeve. Uh, his defenders would say that Lindsay's subdued reaction was a self-defense mechanism. In fact, months after the disappearance, the detective superintendent working the case actually went on record to say that he believed Lindsay was being judged unfairly because of his demeanor. And provided that they're completely innocent, I'm sure that Lindsay and Patsy still feel the pain of their daughter's disappearance after all these years. But let's not forget that they also lost a second child when Blake was killed in 1997. When you're forced to deal with that much grief, at some point you just decide that you need to move on and live the rest of your life. So let's put the Warlidge's emotional reactions aside and focus entirely on the evidence. Is there anything which points to them being involved in Eloise's disappearance? Well, I really don't see any reason to believe that Patsy was involved. I know that both parents were treated as suspects because there were some inconsistencies with the specific details of their stories, such as the exact time they woke up that morning and the exact time they discovered Eloise was missing. But when you're being questioned in an extremely stressful situation such as this, I'm sure it can be very difficult to keep specific details like that straight. But in spite of a few minor inconsistencies, I really don't see any major red flags or glaring holes in their stories. It is a bit strange that both parents forgot to lock the front door that night, but it's not overly implausible that something like that could happen. If there was some suspicion directed towards the parents, I'd say that all of it would go towards Lindsay because of the coincidental timing of the couple's impending separation. It does seem troubling that Eloise would disappear the night before Lindsay was scheduled to move out, and that he also made a last-minute decision to postpone his contract signing with the real estate agent several hours before it happened. But would Lindsay really go so far as to harm his own daughter in an attempt to save his marriage? Well, even when Patsy suspected her husband might be involved, I don't think she pictured him actually harming Eloise. I think she pictured a scenario where Lindsay kept their daughter stashed away for a few days as a means of postponing their separation. If this traumatic ordeal somehow brought the couple closer together again and prompted Patsy to reconsider the separation, then maybe Eloise would conveniently resurface unharmed. But of course, that never actually happened and the couple only drifted further apart. So let's see what the timeline would have been like if Lindsay was involved. Patsy went to bed at 11 p.m. and awoke at 4.45 a.m. to use the bathroom. And since she didn't mention anything about her husband being missing, then that means Lindsay must have been in bed next to her at that time. So if Lindsay orchestrated Eloise's abduction, then it would have had to have taken place within a window of just under six hours. Now, of course, we also have reports from neighbors who claimed they heard a child's cry and a car door slamming at around 2 a.m. If these sounds were connected to Eloise and Lindsay was responsible, then that means he had a window of less than three hours to take Eloise out of the house, take her elsewhere, return home, and climb back into bed before Patsy woke up to use the bathroom. And that's certainly possible, but it seems strange to me that Lindsay would wait three hours after his wife fell asleep before he put his plan into motion. I think he would want to allow as much time as possible to take Eloise out of the house and return home without his wife noticing. And assuming the sound of the child's cry was Eloise, I'd have to wonder if she'd give off that reaction if it was her own father taking her out of the house. However, I've thought up another potential scenario. Remember that strange detail about Lindsay leaving the hall light on before he went to bed? Instead of abducting Eloise himself, what if Lindsay hired someone to take his daughter out of the house? He leaves the front door unlocked and the hall light on, so it will be easier for his accomplice to sneak into the house and grab Eloise. That person will then hold Eloise at an unknown location while Lindsay tries to rekindle his relationship with his wife, and once Patsy reconsiders the separation, Eloise will conveniently be found unharmed and no one will be the wiser. But unfortunately, something goes horribly wrong, such as an accident, and Eloise winds up dead. And after that, the whole thing turns into a cover-up on Lindsay's part. Uh, the scenario does sound pretty absurd, but it's actually not unheard of. Uh, believe it or not, there are some horribly selfish parents out there who have orchestrated fake kidnapping schemes with their own children. The most notorious example of this is probably the case of Shannon Matthews, a nine-year-old British girl who was kidnapped in 2008. But it turned out that Shannon's own mother had enlisted an accomplice to kidnap Shannon and keep her hidden. So that way, Shannon's mother could generate a bunch of publicity for her child's disappearance, and then later on they could collect on a substantial reward once Shannon was found. But I don't know, I'm just not sure that this is the case with Lindsay Warlich, because it is so easy for idiotic kidnapping schemes like these to fall apart. Uh, the police have never uncovered any evidence that Lindsay might have had an accomplice, and if something did go wrong with their plan and Eloise died, I have a hard time believing they could keep the whole thing under wraps for 40 years. 
Lindsay would have to be a very cold-blooded person to just get remarried and move on with his life if he played a role in his own daughter's death. So now let's examine the suspicious abduction scene in Eloise's bedroom. While it looked like the opening in the fly screen had been cut from the inside, let's also not forget that there was some bark from the outside garden found on the floor. So did the perpetrator enter the house through the front door and deliberately plant some bark in the bedroom? While the police did perform some tests with a similar fly screen window, and they determined that it wouldn't have been impossible for someone to open the window from the outside and then lean inside to cut through the fly screen and roll it up. If they weren't a particularly large person, then theoretically they could have climbed into the bedroom through that opening. However, they probably wouldn't have been able to do that without disturbing the dust and cobwebs which were found around the window. Yet it is possible, if unlikely, they could have cut through the fly screen from outside without disturbing anything, but then changed their mind and decided to enter the house through the front door. Now, we have tons of eyewitness sightings pointing to the presence of a prowler in the neighborhood that night, but the differences in the timeline make it difficult to form a concrete theory. Uh, we have the sightings of the young man outside the Warledge residence around midnight, who was seen climbing over the fence, and we've got the sound of the child's cry and the car door slamming at around 2 a.m. And let's also not forget the neighbor who thought he heard someone breaking into his tool shed at around 10 p.m., and the sighting of the green station wagon parked near the Warledge home at 11.40. If you put all these sightings together, then I guess it's possible that the man seen climbing over the Warledge's fence could have abducted Eloise and took her away in the green station wagon. But the most likely time of Eloise's abductions is two hours after this man was seen, and I'm not sure he would have hung around outside the Warledge home for that amount of time. Yet there's also another neighbor who thought they heard a prowler outside their home at around 12.16 a.m., so here's what I think about the mysterious young man. I think it's possible he might have been prowling the neighborhood that night and was the same person who broke into the tool shed. I think he might have ducked into the Warledge's yard to avoid being seen, but then decided to go on his way once the coast was clear. He never actually entered the Warledge home, and it's just a coincidence that Eloise was abducted from this exact same house later that night. And there's also some confusion about the presence of the green station wagon in the neighborhood. On Eloise Warledge's Wikipedia page, it states that a neighbor reported seeing a dark green car speeding down Scott Street at 2 a.m., which would seem to imply that this station wagon was the vehicle used to abduct Eloise. And if that was the case, this would point to the parents being 100% innocent, since they did not own a green station wagon. However, in a very detailed 2003 article about the case, which was published in the Australian newspaper The Age, it states that a neighbor saw a car speeding down the street with its headlights turned off at 10.30 that night, but it makes no mention of any witnesses seeing a car speed away at 2 a.m. And, of course, since this is Wikipedia we're talking about, I can only assume that the article from The Age is the most accurate source, and that no one actually saw a car speeding away at 2 a.m., uh, we still have the sounds of the child's cry and a car door slamming at that time, but we can't be sure which vehicle might have been used to take Eloise away. So we still don't know if the green station wagon actually has any connection to this case, or how long it was parked in the neighborhood that night. The police still lean towards the theory of someone taking Eloise out through the front door, and since Eloise was a very shy person, it seems likely it would have been done by someone familiar to her, such as her parents or someone else she knew and trusted. I'm assuming that the sound of the child's cry that the neighbors reported had to have taken place outside the Warledge home, because if it took place inside the house, then it probably would have woken up the rest of her family. It's almost like Eloise was unconcerned when she first left her home, but when her abductor placed her inside a vehicle, the child started realizing that something might be wrong and made a noise. So could Eloise have been abducted by someone she knew outside of her own family? And, well, if true, that might explain why an intruder would go to the trouble of cutting a hole in the fly screen from inside Eloise's bedroom. Uh, they wanted to stage an abduction scene which looked just phony enough to divert all the suspicion towards the parents. It's not an implausible theory, but once again, I don't think the police ever found any compelling evidence to suggest that someone connected to the Warledges might be responsible. But if I had to lean towards one direction or the other, I would have to say that neither Lindsay or Patsy Warledge were responsible for their daughter's disappearance. I mean, the Warledges were just your ordinary middle-class family. They were not wealthy individuals with influence who could orchestrate some sort of cover-up. I think it's very telling that even though the police did treat Lindsay Warledge as a suspect, the detective superintendent was willing to go on record to say he was being unfairly judged. Even though the Warledges were never eliminated as suspects, I don't think the police ever felt that strongly that they were responsible. Now, I haven't the slightest idea who actually could be responsible for Eloise's disappearance, but I think whoever did it was a very twisted and calculating individual. They essentially committed the perfect crime, leaving behind no evidence of what happened to Eloise, and creating just enough misdirection to turn the investigation towards her parents. I have a feeling this was not the only crime this perpetrator ever committed, and sadly, I wouldn't be surprised if they have harmed other children besides Eloise. 
Whoever it was, I can only hope they either passed away or wound up being incarcerated for another crime before they did too much harm. In the end, I'm not sure we'll ever know the full truth about what happened to Eloise Warledge, but I really hope she did not suffer. While I'm glad her family was able to find closure and go on to live fulfilling lives after this tragedy, I still hope that they can learn the full truth someday. So that's about it for the Trail Went Cold's first international mystery. I know I've chronicled a cold case that's 40 years old now, but if by chance any of you out there actually have information about the unsolved disappearance of Eloise Warledge, please contact the proper authorities. But if you have your own theory about what happened, I'd love to hear from you. If you have some interesting information about this case which wasn't covered on this episode, feel free to leave a comment or send me an email. I can be reached at robin.warder at icloud.com. That's R-O-B-I-N dot W-A-R-D-E-R at I-C-L-O-U-D dot com. Robin.warder at icloud.com. Also, be sure to check out The Trail Went Cold on Facebook and Twitter. We're available on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Music right now, so be sure to leave us a rating or a review at either of these places because that will help us garner more exposure. And like I announced earlier, The Trail Went Cold now has its own PayPal account and a donation button, so if by chance you're feeling generous and feel like contributing a little something, no matter how small or large your donation might be, all of us here would greatly appreciate your support. And you can also check out my true crime and mystery articles at crack.com and listverse.com, and there's plenty of other non-true crime content you can find right here at the back row. So have yourself a good two weeks and join me next time for another edition of The Trail Went Cold. I shall now bid you farewell with one more sampling of Triangulum. The Trail Went Cold is part of the Back Row Podcast Network. Visit the back rowcom for more. The theme song was composed by Vince Nitro. Yeah, we